Dear participant, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer of the Social Economy Leaders Forum who asked me to speak as a keynote speaker. The theme of this forum is particularly relevant as the health crisis in Europe is once again expanding. We must both reflect on the impact of the crisis on our society, measure its effect and not only on the economy, but at the same time identifying, bringing out the perspective and release all the potential carried by the social economy, enterprise and organization. I will try to answer to the two main questions that have been asked of me. How much are social economy affected by pandemic and how is the social economy trying to overcome this period? And the second question, how Europe has been considering the role of social economy in realizing transition to green economy? I would start by answering the first question. Because the way out of the health crisis undoubtedly go through a change in our pattern of production and consumption supported by a green and sustainable growth. Social Economy Europe, the main European organization, has realized in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic a survey, which swept across Europe during the first half of 2020. Other than a high cost in terms of human lives, the pandemic had a strong social and economic significance and it's forced individuals to stay home and financial activities to close while further exacerbating a series of social and economic divides within European societies and globally, in particular in the ability to access service and support system. In the, this context, the contribution of social economy has been crucial. Social economy enterprise and organization have been doing the at most to support individuals and businesses, in particular those most at risk. They have been providing healthcare, food and social services to the most vulnerable groups, financial and business support to small enterprise, insurance as well as other basic services such as water and energy to society at large. Social economy enterprise and organization are innovative resilient and have a strong societal objective. While being at the forefront of the crisis and offering alternative solutions to the ongoing economic and social challenges, they also struggled through the pandemic. In this context, the survey carried out in May 2020 aimed at gathering a clear picture of the situation of social economy enterprise and organization during the COVID-19 pandemic as well as their needs for the future. Specifically, the survey investigated the specificities of the impact of the crisis on activities and employment, of the support measure, and as well as the possible obstacle encountered. The survey also asked to elaborate on needs and recommendations for the post-crisis period. In total, around 218 social economy enterprises an organization from 13 European member states and a non-European country, Turkey, responded to the online survey. Before going in details of the survey, I would like to underline the main message for policymakers. It is clear that governmental measures such as temporary unemployment schemes and different types of financial support are crucial to keep social economy enterprise alive. What are the results of the survey? Social economy companies hit hard. 88% of the surveyed enterprise and organization maintained that the pandemic had long down strongly affected their activities, while 71% claimed that COVID had a strong impact on employment within their businesses. Employment repercussion. 31% of the surveyed state they put temporary unemployment scheme in place. 18% suffered or reduced or suspended activities, so reduced worker hours. 12% of the surveyed reported needing to fire staff. On the lack of business support, 
Respondent highlighted that in many occasions the support measures all out at the time of the survey were not designed, taking into account the specificities of social economy enterprise and organization. Others mentioned that the measure was simply not accessible by all economic actors. Many employers saw themselves forced to lay, staff, to lay off staff, reduce or suspend activities and reduce working hours. Ensuring access of all social economy actors to governmental support scheme is fundamental for the resilience of social economy enterprise and organization and the ability to recover and continue providing innovative solutions to today's most pressing needs. Needs of the social economy. Many respondents set a lot of income to be one of their main difficulties. Similarly, financial support appears frequently among the needs to recover from the crisis. Particularly, respondents mention the need for improved access to guaranteed loans with low interest rates, both from national and EU level, from social economy enterprise and organization. What are the recommendations coming from this survey? Extend an employment support was one of the most frequent recommendations. Make childcare more accessible to ensure work-life balance since working remotely. Reduce bureaucracy and administrative burdens in accessing support measures and for information to be available. Progressive loosening of restrictive measures accompanied by a strengthened health system and the free provision of protective equipment so that the enterprise can restart activities and ensure that the safety of their workers, customers and beneficiaries. Government should make psychosocial support available and accessible, especially for healthcare and care workers. The difficulties experienced by the respondent in accessing national, regional or local support was expressed very clearly. The given reasons include a lack of understanding of awareness of the social economic by public authorities. For this, respondents recommend for social economic terms to be involved in institutional dialogue. Despite the difficulties faced by the social economy, a message of solidarity transpired through the survey. Respondents share experience of peer-to-peer -peer support of and solidarity amongst the social economy community. There is hope that this enterprise and organization will recover and bounce back, as 43% of the survey believe that they will be able to fully recover from the effect of the crisis in the coming months. But it was before. We, know, we don't know yet how far the situation will go. We are now facing a new situation and we will drive the social economy further. The second question was how Europe has been considering the role of social economy in realizing transition to green economy. I would like to start by clarifying what we should understand by notion of transition. Transition refers to a process of transformation in which a system moves from one regime of equilibrium to another. The transition is therefore not a simple adjustment, but a fundamental reconfiguration of the functioning and organization of the system. This structural transformation simultaneously affects the technological, economic, ecological, socio-cultural and institutional sectors and development in this sector are mutually reinforcing. The transition is thus characterized by a gradual and profound change in model of society over the long term. It's a process that cannot be fully mastered since it's part of a complex system that escapes rigid, rigid planning. Today we are at a point in history where the ecological and energy transition has only just begun. It is the very foundation of our ways of producing and consuming that the ecological emergency seriously questions. 
The challenge is as simply as it is designing. It is that of inventing the society of tomorrow, a different society compatible with an increasingly pressing environmental constraint. The pursuit of the desirable alternative is at the heart of the history of social economy. And with all modesty, we have the capacity to be at the birth of the new sustainable world. The social economy creates, develops, raises awareness and trains in all sectors of activity. The social economy is not an economy of repairing the damage caused by capitalism. Social economy structure must be mobilizing around two axes, raising awareness on environmental issues, but above all, showing that action is possible. The social economy experimenting with new form of economic organization. Social economy structure are creative and invent new models that implement new economic arrangements. Some improve their worth and have experiences considerable development. There is thousands of experiments. Social economy are at the forefront in providing innovative solutions to environmental, social, economic challenge. The 1,500 renewable energy cooperative operating in Europe that unite one million citizens are leading the energy transition. Social enterprise active in Euros, repair and recycling are a pioneer in job creation linked to the circular economy. There are many other examples on the potential of the social economy in areas such as sustainable and energy efficient housing, smart mobility solutions, citizen power station, cooperative society in the agriculture sector which preserve products and values in the territory, urban agriculture project, short secret organic farming, logistic structure with all have different organization, the socio-economic integration of population far from the labor market, other updating and reinventing themselves as consumer cooperative. It is in this experimental environment that we must look for the models that will spread tomorrow. The social economy must combine ecological and energy transition with social ambition. The social economy plays citizen in a decision-making situation in order to facilitate the reappropriation of mode of production and consumption. It is one of the specificities and one of the markers of social economy to open up the government on the principle of one person in one voice, regardless of its capital contribution. Social economy enterprise can accelerate European green transition through energy communities and renewable energy cooperative, a key driver in the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy and from a centralized energy market to a decentralized market in which citizens produce and consume their own energy. We are prosumers. Decentralized energy system create more jobs than centralized system and provide a wide range of benefits for the local communities of Europe. Furthermore, social economy has been recognized by the Commission as a pioneer in job creation linked to the circular economy and its forerunners in sustainable agriculture. We build the future because we are the future. I thank you for your attention and I wish you a very fruitful conference. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michael Len and I'm the Director of Reuse. It's an absolute pleasure to be invited to the Social Economy Leads Forum and I'm really happy to share a few insights from Europe into how social enterprises are contributing to the green and circular transition. I'll also touch upon what can be further done to support their work from a policy perspective, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion afterwards. In terms of the presentation structure, I'll provide an overview of our organization, who we are and what we do, and then I'll briefly run through some of the main policy frameworks and EU initiatives that we are following and the main points that we would like to get across. Reuse is an international network of social enterprises active in the circular economy, 
majority of our members work in the field of reuse, repair and recycling. And today we have 31 members across 26 countries, with a wider network of some 850 social enterprises. We're based in Brussels and Belgium and work on advocacy on behalf of our members towards the EU institutions and stakeholders. The reason for this is that many EU laws, notably in the environment field, have a direct impact in the way in which our members operate. And so we push for a legal framework that is really as supportive of their activities as possible. The majority of social enterprises within our network are work integration so, so, social enterprises. So these organizations use the economic activity of reuse and repair to provide job and training opportunities for persons most at risk of social exclusion. And as you can see from the pictures, the reuse sector is particularly work intensive and therefore excellent in providing transferable skills for the open labor market and hopefully also for a future social circular economy. In terms of some figures, the 850 social enterprises from our wider network collectively handle around 1 million tonnes of goods and materials, of which around one third is reused. This activity provides jobs for around 95,000 individuals. Now the figures you can see here are from 2018, but we will be releasing our 2019 figures in the next few weeks, so we'll be sure to send them through to you. To give a little bit more context, I wanted to show you some pictures. So as you can see, the majority of reuse members work in the collection, sorting and sales of household goods. This includes furniture, textiles and electronics. Um, here you can see a typical example of a professional second-hand shop operated by a social enterprise, and this one happens to be from the Netherlands. But beyond household goods, there's a great variety of new sectors that social enterprises are moving into, such as the reuse of construction materials, the reuse and remanufacturing of paint, and even sustainable events management and rental of camping equipment. So there's a great variety of business models and innovation in the field of reuse that our members are involved with. So it's clear that social enterprises active in the circular economy provide strong environmental and social benefits. They generate local job and training opportunities, they support the environment through product life extension, they value natural resources, and they also support our local economy. And it's because of this really strong social focus and social orientation that makes them resilient, even in times of crisis such as the current COVID-19 pandemic. So many social enterprises have faced serious challenges throughout the crisis, notably as a result of lockdowns, and many have had to stop their activities. But they have also shown incredible initiative on supporting their local communities and workers throughout these difficult times. And these activities included the provision of essential goods to frontline workers and to vulnerable members of the community, food distribution services and the operation of food banks, provision of shelter and relief items to the homeless, support services and networks created spontaneously to people who had lost their jobs, to vulnerable members of our community, to the, such as the elderly and minority groups. I mean, the list goes on. Um, and so during the pandemic, uh, reuse has been push pushing really hard uh, together with other representatives of social economy um, to really support social enterprise during the crisis. And I'll say a few words about what we were doing in a moment. So let's have a look at some of those general policy frameworks that we've been following and that are of particular relevance to our discussions today. The first is the EU Green Deal, which was published in 2019, and it sets out the ambition for Europe to be the first climate neutral continent by 2050. As part of its COVID recovery strategy, the European Commission really sees the green and digital transitions as strong guiding principles to do so. The Green Deal contains a number of actions, including ambitious climate law, improved supply of clean and affordable energy, as well as the push for the circular economy. Now, it's the circular economy which the EU Commission sees as a regenerative economic model for a clean and more competitive Europe. And in March this year, the Commission published its updated circular economy action plan, and something that Reuse has really been engaging on and will continue to do so. And this plan contains a number of legislative and non-legislative actions to be carried out through, throughout the current Commission's mandate. It includes a focus on better product design, sustainable production and consumption, as well as better implementation of EU waste law. It also provides a much deeper focus on certain provisions for specific value chains, notably ICT, textiles, buildings and food. 
Now, Reuse has been uh, monitoring the development of circular, economic, circular economy policies for many years now, and it's clear that things are moving in the right direction. But some things that are being questioned are in particular concerning how inclusive with, will this circular transition actually be? Will it only favour big business? Who will be able to access or even afford circular services? So what is the role in this vision of a circular economy for local and community-based social enterprises? We're really happy to note that the Circular Economy Action Plan recognises the role of social enterprises as pioneer in the circular economy and it, that they are key actors in making circularity work for regions, cities and people. So it gives us hope that the circular economy will take into account the importance of social inclusion. There are also references to a number of other important EU employment strategies currently under development. This includes the EU Pact for Skills and also an EU Action Plan for the Social Economy, which is something I wanted to mention in a little bit more detail now. So the EU Social Economy Action Plan is currently under development and is set to be published next year in the summer. It's a key priority for the EU Commissioner for Employment, Nicola Schmidt, and aims to provide a roadmap of actions regarding how the social economy should be supported over the next years. It's likely it will include points on access to finance, technical innovation, such as the role of digitalization and the links with social economy, as well as overarching promotion of legal frameworks for social enterprise that you see different ones across EU countries. It's also clear that the lessons learned from COVID crisis will feature prominently in this action plan. So we hope this initiative will be a key tool to help mainstream so the concept of social economy across many different policy domains, and we are actively providing input into the consultation process. So in summary, Reuse is trying its best to support the development of a comprehensive and cohesive EU policy framework for social enterprises and, <clears throat> and aims to build complementarity between policy initiatives such as the Circular Economy Action Plan, the Social Economy Action Plan and any policies which have an impact on local economic well-being. So specifically, what do we want to see from EU policy? Well, this is just a snapshot of what we're trying to promote, but there are more detailed positions on our website. So on the environmental side, one of the biggest focus areas is to push for strong laws supporting reuse and repair. Today, the focus of policy makers is very much on recycling. Um, but whilst this is an important element of the circular economy, it's not the same thing as reuse. So some of the things which we would like to see include mandatory eco-design requirements, ensuring products are easily repairable and durable. We also want to see stronger policies favouring waste prevention. This can include, for example, quantitative targets for reuse. Fiscal measures encouraging reuse and repair for citizens are really, really important. And also making these activities financially viable for reuse and repair operators such as social enterprises. So such tools can include extended producer responsibility and value-added tax or VAT and certainly adaptations of those tools is something that we're really uh, looking at in detail. On the social and employment policy side, tools such as public and private procurement are really important for us. We want to see increased implementation of the use of social clauses within tendering procedures that will positively discriminate social enterprises. Access to financing has to be made easier. We can really see during the pandemic, for example, that in some countries it was extremely difficult or even impossible for social enterprises to actually gain uh, any funding or access to public funding schemes, um, in particular because some of their legal forms or the legal forms of social enterprises are being not recognised by national governments as being eligible. So this is why it's really important to have strong education programs for public bodies to improve cross-departmental understanding of what social enterprises are and that government administrations are better placed to provide the support that they need. And finally, being able to demonstrate social impact through appropriate metrics is a really important area. A number of our members have developed really interesting social and environmental impact calculators and are using these to help show customers why it's important to buy local, green and social. In terms of the EU's specific response to COVID-19, you may be aware that the EU is discussing its budget for the next seven years, 
It's worth around 1 trillion euros, and it's also discussing an additional recovery package of some 750 billion euros. Now, how that money will actually be distributed in the end is subject to discussion at the moment, but we're really happy to see that social economy actors have been recognised as key actors having been impacted by the COVID crisis. And so we really hope that over the next months and yeah, in the near future, that extra, extra support measures will be making their way towards social enterprises at national and local level. So by means of conclusion, um, we can see that the momentum for the circular economy is definitely growing. And social enterprises are recognised as important actors in implementing the circular economy. But it's clear that still a lot needs to be done to better support and recognise the positive impacts that they generate. And the EU must continue to prioritise investment and activity in the circular economy and fulfil its Green Deal commitments, certainly in a post-COVID crisis, in a post-COVID crisis recovery. The future social economy action plan must deliver to help ensure that the green and circular transition is as inclusive as possible. So thank you for your attention and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. So thank you for seeing me. Uh, I'm uh, Søren Hammondsen and I'm from Samsø Energy Academy. I'm speaking to you from, uh, from the Energy Academy, which is situated on Samsø, which is an island in the middle of Denmark. I will, in this uh, presentation, talk to you about a project that started uh, uh, 20 years ago. Samsø uh, was elected to be the Danish energy island and thereby uh, able to prove that Denmark was able to convert from fossil fuels to renewable energy in a time span of just uh, 10 years. The, the reason for this to happen was that we saw uh, a development uh, in the world uh, registered in the Kyoto conference, which was COP3 in Japan, where the Danish minister of the environment, he promised that Denmark would cut down 21% of the present CO2 emission. To prove that th this was possible, it was sent out as a, as a company petition and Denmark uh, selected Samsø as the Danish energy island and thereby uh, registering um, whatever happened on this island as a documentation that uh, this transition was possible. So what we did was we took this top-down decision from the government and said we need to change this into a local context and talk to this from a local uh, point of view. So we called it a commodity, which is community uh, and uh, administrating the commons. The commons is everything we share. It could be energy values, it could be resources and anything else here also. Community administrating the common must be commodity. This is a non-existing English word, so you, don't, you shouldn't look it up because it doesn't exist, but we try to find a word that describes what we do here. So this will, in my presentation, be my focus. So what is a sustainable island? Which is a the next slide in my in my presentation here. Um, it, it is an image of a field, a yellow field, which is like uh, rapeseed oil or canola oil, but there's a little place in the middle with trees in it, which I think is symbolizing my island, which is a place where we allow biodiversity, we allow different species to live there at the same time as we are part of a bigger structure. So Samsø is not a standalone project, but it's connected to the world. We export, import, uh, we live a very normal life as, as anybody else, but we are surrounded by water. So therefore we can, we can actually uh, see what is happening here. So next slide is number three. What we're looking at is, is, is three challenges. We're looking at climate change as the big factor here. We are surrounded by water and therefore we see rising sea levels as a problem. If this happens, we will be in problem. We will be in big trouble uh, because a lot of the land will, will disappear. So we need to do something about that and secure the area. Uh, security supply, I mean, being a remote little place, we are so depending on imported uh, energy from outside. So when it was fossil fuels, it was oil, gas, petroleum, and other things, also and electric electricity. So changing from fossil fuel to renewable energy gave us a new possibility of being more secure so we could produce and administrate both the prices and the amount of energy that we are using uh, on a regular basis. And the last point is that we are looking at industry, economy and jobs, which is very basic for any community in the world that we need jobs so we can feed 
uh, and pay the salaries to workers in the community so they can pay their bills and buy stuff in the grocery shop and have their cars mended in the in the garage and 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 be able to be part of the Danish uh, and, and the local energy uh, economy in, in, in total. Having a job is it, it essential for people to live in a place like this. And the next slide is indicating uh, how the energy system is operating in, in Denmark. We are part of a, of a bigger energy infrastructure. So it's called energinet.dk, which is the D in Danish uh, high voltage backbone administrator. So everything we produce is fed into the national system and we buy it back from the system again. So what the system operator is responsible for is to balance the loads. So we have enough energy in, pumped into the system so we can use whatever is necessary here. Also in a combination with solar, wind, biomass, uh, decentralized heat and power, import from Sweden and Norway and Germany and export to Sweden and Norway and Germany at the same time. North Pool is the, is the market, and we are all part of this uh, very interesting and very reliable energy market. Sometimes we have more than 100% renewable energy in the Danish energy infrastructure, which is really too much to administrate, but it's possible because we can export loads to Norway and Sweden and keep it in the, in the hydro dams. Next slide, please. So, so the, 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 the collaboration between sectors is a necessary condition for a successful sustainable transition. We couldn't do this alone if we didn't work together with farmers, with industry, with politics, with local people and NGOs and, and all this network of society that is generally having an opinion about how the world looks from here. So when we do this transition, we need to work together with all these entities so we can ask the stakeholders, what do they think? How do they participate? And what is the economy, both the social economy and the, and the physical economy in this transition? And then we can make a successful uh, translation. So the next one, number six, energy, the self-sufficient island. I won't go into details about what we did, but in just a few years, like 10 years before this, we invested almost 400 million Danish kroner, which is, I mean, almost half a billion, which is in dollars, probably 70 million dollars uh, worth of, of energy infrastructure investments. We invested in onshore wind turbines, 11 megawatt, offshore wind turbines, 23 megawatt. And then we invested in, in uh, straw-fired heat plants and other things here also to make it possible for us to to uh, heat the houses. And all this was a part of this transition. And, and, and you can see much more at the Energy Academy website, but I think in details just to show and indicate that we actually did what we promised to do. Next slide. We did this in an environment that is very nice. And, and I don't know how it works in Korea, but we have a lot of discussion about, um, about wind power in the, in the landscape. So the wind power turbines in the landscape is in many ways, um, sometimes a discussion about pollution, that we think that the wind turbines is taking away the grand views of, of an island. Samsa is also a tourist destination, and therefore it's sometimes a little bit complicated to build wind turbines. But here you see a very early morning picture before the sun rises, and you can see there's some smoke in the background just to the left of one of the wind turbines. This is a nearby power station on the mainland with a big CO2 emission. So you can indirectly or theoretically say that the wind, wind turbines is ventilating the smoke away from Samsø, which is not entirely true, but we are producing CO2 free energy from the wind turbines. And therefore we can argue that we will reduce the CO2 emission from the power stations, which is always nice to have as an argument for the installation in the landscape. And the other thing is that we own these wind turbines. So people like myself and my neighbors, we have a chance to invest in the cooperatively owned wind turbines. And therefore, because I'm an owner of the wind turbines, it's sometimes easier to understand why they are there. Well, because they are mine and I'm as a co-owner, they look better and they even sound better because they are my wind turbine. Instead of it's a power company or somebody else's wind turbine, then they become a little bit more uh, alienated and we don't like them so much as if they were our own. So next slide, number eight. So thereby we also built offshore wind turbines. When we first successfully erected the land-based wind turbines, we got more courage. So we convinced the local community that we should build uh, 10 big offshore wind turbines 
mainly to compensate for the CO2 emission from the wind, from the, from the cars and the ferries and the heavy trucks. So we could produce CO2 free energy from these wind turbines. This was the biggest investments ever made on the, in the local community on Samsu. And the technology there was, it was new to us. So we didn't know much about it. So we learned a lot in this process. So there's a lot of capacity building and learning in the process also why we were doing this. Next, please. We were using, basically we were using technologies that was, what, what do you call it, state of the art. We, we, we didn't use uh, rocket science, new technology. We used technology that was tested in the field and that we could buy from the shops. So solar panels, flatbed for heating, we use straw, uh, thermostats and pumps and everything that we could buy in the shop. And we combined it in, in, in new ways. So we could use these technologies to make us independent from fossil fuels. Next, please, slide number 10. We also use the surplus electricity to charge cars. So we put up charging stations. And today we have more electric cars than any municipalities in Denmark. And we try to use as much energy as we can to charge the batteries. So we, we are also walking the, 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 the walk or walking the talk, so to speak, and using our own energies. Next, please. Slide number 11 is, is a picture of a solar garage where we have a charging station. All the municipal cars are electric today. And we have more and more electric cars also in the social uh, area where the service people are driving uh, electric cars uh, and charging them from these uh, garages here. 12, number 12, sustainability is to be able to sustain. Uh, and you can say that we break this word up again. Sustain is to be able to do things. So we need to educate people also to be able to handle this transition. So sustainability is not just an abstract word, but it's a practical learning process where we learn how to take care of things also. Number 13, a strong, sustainable and robust community must share locality, activity and mentality, especially the last is, is interesting. How do, you, how do you work with the mentality part of this also? This is where it, it becomes difficult because we have to understand how it is. The next slide, number 14, common ground, but different reasons. We are talking to people from a common ground. We have this one island, but we have many different reasons. We are farmers and teachers and citizens, and we want to make this happen. Next slide, number 15. Power without love is coarse and ruthless. Love without power is sentimental. We need to make this happen, but we need to look at the, the vision people and talk about how we make transition. And number 16, and this is, the, the vision of things. We need to talk about what, how, where do we see ourselves in 10 years or 12 years from now? Uh, so we can see that uh, the vision is, is going to be kind of realized, it's possible to be there. And the next slide, number 17, when we create a common sense of ownership, the road is open for development. And thereby you can say, we need to see the same picture in the future. Otherwise, we'll work in many different directions. So the common sense of ownership is very vital for the transition. So next, please. And thereby, you can see we are building things. This is an offshore structure. Next, please, number 19. We are setting technology in, in together. And next, 20, slide number 20. Radical societal development calls for top down and bottom up to walk hand in hand. We need the governmental po uh, point of view and the local point of view to kind of meet in between. Otherwise, we'll just have a, a top down legislation and people won't understand what is possible here. Number 21. So these are owners. These are the local people who, who are part of this process. We need to involve people in the process so they understand their role and they also become responsible co-owners of the process. Number 22, if you want to develop and change, it's important to meet people where they are. This is a crucial point all the time. We can't just talk to a nation or talk to uh, an organization. We need to talk directly to people so they understand what is my role, what can I do? And number 23, I mean, we're all Vikings and I think it's not very alien from the Korean culture. We are very individual thinking and we need to respect that people have different opinions about this also. So we talk to individuals, not to, to, to common structures. Number 24. So we, we, we are sailing in a direction where we, everybody is kind of looking at the future. We don't know where we're going, but if we do it together, we're sure we can do it. And number 23, 
an experiment doesn't have to be perfect. Experiments can open the way for something radically new. And I think this is what we are heading at. We don't really know if we're going to be successful, but we need to try, otherwise nothing will change. And the last slide, uh, number 26, is uh, me working. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you want to know more, you can look at these uh, websites here and uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll be well informed. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank
이런 방식이 정말 지금 코로나 국면에 일자리가 다급하고 사람들이 뭔가 하기를 갈급하는 상황에서 이 그린 뉴딜이 정책이 지역에서 실행되면 은 오히려 안될것 같다라는 생각이 들었고요. 세 번째, 지자체가 준비하고 있는 그린 뉴딜 정책에 시민과 도민들이 없습니다. 이 그린 뉴딜 정책을 펼쳤을 때 시민들의 삶은 어떻게 안전망을 갖추게 되는지 어떤 희망을 갖고 내가 역할할 수 있는지에 대해서 시민들의 삶이 녹아나 있지 않은 이런 그린 뉴딜로는 안 된다라는 생각을 갖게 됐고요. 그래서 저는 이 기후위기 대응은 에너지 영역만이 아니라고 생각합니다. 모든 영역이 기후위기에 대응을 해야 되고 지금 우리나라 광역 지자체 중에서 탄소 중립을 기반으로 기후위기 대응을 수립한 곳은 서울시 정도가 있습니다. 서울시 같은 경우에는 2050년에 넷제로를 두고 저 목표를 달성하기 위해서 서울의 온실가스 배출량이 많은 건물 부분, 수송 부분, 폐기물 부분 어떻게 하고 저걸 흡수하기 위해서 나무를 어떻게 심을지 이런 방식으로 접근을 하고 있거든요. 그래서 저는 이 그린, 유, 그린 유딜이라고 했을 때 우리 사회가 정말 기후위기 대응을 위해서는 수치적으로라도 온실가스를 줄여야 되고 그리고 각각의 영역에서 어떤 역할을 하는 경제가 등장해야 될지에 대해서 아주 폭넓게 준비해야 된다라는 생각이 들었습니다. 아침에 일어나서 와 2050년 넷째로 사회는 어떤 사회일까 이런 고민을 해보면 저는 30년 뒤의 사회에서 우리가 같은 지금의 수출 규모, 지금의 기업 형태, 지금의 경제 총량을 유지할 수 있을까? 아무래도 힘들 텐데 그리고 이동성이 상당히 줄어들 수도 있을 텐데 그랬을 때 결국은 지역이 너무나 중요해질 거다라는 생각이 들고요. 그리고 온실가스 배출량 넷제로를 달성하는 경제 시스템에서는 지역을 기반으로 꼭 필요한 서비스, 꼭 필요한 자원을 지역사회에서 생산하고 소비하는 이런 시스템으로 준비해 가야 되지 않을까라는 생각이 들었습니다. 그래서 그린 뉴딜 분야의 사회적 경제의 원칙과 목표에 대해서 저는 좀 잡았으면 좋겠다라는 생각이 들었고요. 그래서 이 사회적 경제가 온실가스 감축만 아니라 아까 라이프라인 코리아에서 얘기했던 것처럼 각종 재난에 대비하는 적응 분야에서도 사회적 경제가 역할을 할 수가 있다. 그리고 모든 영역이 그린 뉴딜과 온실가스 감축으로 연결될 수 있다. 우리가 에너지는 어, 재생가능 에너지 확산하는 거 중요하지만 에너지는 모든 영역에서 쓰입니다. 그래서 사람들의 삶을 에너지로만 딱 떼서 볼 것이 아니라 모든 필요한 이 기후위기 시대에 사람들이 살아가는 모든 영역에서 저는 그림을 그려볼 수 있겠다라는 생각이 들었고요. 그래서 이 어, 코로나와 기후위기 시대에 지역사회에 필요한 모든 인프라 만약에 나는 이 재난시대 그리고 탄소중립 시대에 어떤 서비스가 필요할까라고 생각해보면 은 적응 분야에서는 공공성을 보장하는 의료 그리고 재난 대비 매뉴얼 이런 것들이 적응 분야에서 필요하고요. 감축과 적응이 함께 포괄되는 영역이 폭염과 한파에 대응하면서도 에너지 비용을 줄이고 온실가스를 줄이는 집이 너무나 중요합니다. 거기에 에너지가 필요한 거고 또 먹을거리라든지 교통, 자원순환 영역, 돌봄, 생물 다양성을 보호하고 녹색지대와 연결되는 거 그리고 사람들이 알아야지 2050년 탄소중립사회를 준비할 수 있기 때문에 전환의 학습 그리고 우리가 문화를 빼놓고 얘기할 수 없지 않습니까? 전환의 문화와 예술, 놀거리, 여행 이 모든 영역이 아까 제가 보여드렸던 그림 속에서 온실가스 감축, 일자리 창출 거기에 사회적 약자와 우리 사회의 문제를 해결하는 이세 가지 영역에 부합한다면 은 모든 사회적 경제 영역이 그린 뉴딜과 연결될 수 있다라는 이런 생각이 들었고요. 그래서 찾아봤더니 우리 사회에서도 의료 생협이라든지 방금 라이프라인 코리아가 얘기했듯이 이런 질문들 재난이 오면 장애인들은 어떻게 해야 하나요? 그러면 폭염이든 한파든 홍수든 슈퍼 태풍이든 각각의 재난에 대해서 지역 공동체가 미리 어, 학습하고 훈련하는 매뉴얼 이런 것들을 지역에서 담당하는 지역의 사회적 기업 이런 것들이 지역마다 있어야 되지 않을까요? 거기에 폭염과 한파에 대응하면서 에너지 비용을 줄이는 이 주택에 대한 단열 개선 사업 같은 경우에는 오바마 대통령이 웨더라이제이션이라는 이름으로 
금융위기의 불황을 이겨내는 핵심 정책으로 실행을 했었습니다. 그래서 당선 직후에 어, 상, 오, 우리나라 돈으로 한 5조 정도를 쏟아가지고 100만 가구를 집수리를 하면서 여기에 복지라든지 온실가스 감축이라든지 일자리를 연계했습니다. 그리고 이런 어, 일들은 대기업이 아니라 사회적 기업들이 할수 있는 충분한 집수리 협동조합과 연결될 수 있는 영역이고요. 그리고 제 생각하는 에너지는 우리 안산 시민 햇빛 발전 협동조합이 얘기했던 것처럼 태양광 뿐만 아니라 그리고 바이오 에너지 풍력까지 영역을 매우 확장할 수 있는 분야라고 할 수가 있습니다. 나아가서 재생가능 에너지 뿐만 아니라 DR이라든지 ESS라든지 태양광을 이용한 가상발전 이런 것들도 도시에서 에너지 프로슈머가 돼서 활용할 수 있는 사회적 경제 영역이고요. 또 먹을거리 분야에 있어서도 우리가 이 버려지는 식재료들을 푸드뱅크랑 연결하고 또꼭 필요한 사람들에게 전달하는 이런 것들이 되기 위해서는 프랑스처럼 이 음식물 낭지 아, 음식물 낭비 방지 법안 이런 그래서 이런 것들을 보면은 중앙 정부의 정책 설계가 사회적 기업의 역할을 확장하는 데도 상당히 큰 역할을 한다라는 것들을 볼 수가 있습니다. 그리고 공공 교통 분야에서도 어, 스페인 같은 경우에는 이 전기 자동차만 공유하는 카쉐어링 협동조합 같은 것들이 있습니다. 우리가 택시 협동조합 같은 것들을 실험해 봤었는데요. 어, 말버스 협동조합이라든지 또는 1인 모빌리티 협동조합이라든지 자전거라든지 이런 것들을 운영하고 관리하는 것도 사회적 경제가 할수 있는 영역이 될수 있습니다. 어, 가장 유명하고 지금 바로 할수 있는 영역들은 이 자원순환 분야입니다. 특히 성남 같은 경우에는 아리백이라고 해가지고 시민들이 자발적으로 상당히 분리수거를 잘 해오게 되면 은 그걸 가지고 경제적 가치를 충분히 창출할 수가 있습니다. 그래서 자원순환 영역, 특히 재사용이라든지 또는 다회용기 서비스 사업 이런 것들은 우리가 만들 수 있는 영역이고요. 그리고 돌봄은 너무나 중요한 사회적 경제의 영역이고 이것도 그린 뉴딜이나 기후위기와 연결시킬 수 있을 것 같습니다. 어, 서울에는 사회적 협동조합 한강이 있는데요. 이 한강이 여의 색강 생태공원을 위탁 운영 관리합니다. 도시공원이라든지 중요한 생태계 보전 지역을 지역의 사회적 협동조합이 관리하면서 지역 주민들 활용 프로그램 만드는 것들도 가능하고요. 가장 직접적으로 할수 있는 게이 탄소중립사회에 대한 교육입니다. 그런데 이런 교육이 아주 딱딱한 장소가 아니라 에너지 카페라든지 여기 보면 은 대덕구 같은 경우에는 넷째로 공판장 이런 것들을 만들고 있고요. 지역에너지센터라든지 다양한 곳곳에서 이 활용하는 공간을 활용해서 이 교육이 진행될 수가 있습니다. 지금 정부에서도 그린 스마트 스쿨을 하는데요. 저는 이 그린 스마트 스쿨도 설비의 도입으로만 끝나지 않도록 이게 연결되기 위해서는 지역사회가 그린 스마트 스쿨을 만드는데 개입하고 협력하는 전략 이런 것들이 정말 중요하다라는 말씀을 드리고요. 마지막으로 전환의 문화와 예술과 놀거리 여행이 있습니다. 어, 지역을 기반으로 하는 마을 극장이 있었으면 좋겠고 지금 이미 우리 제주도 같은 경우에는 지역 생태계를 지키면서 생태관광 프로그램을 하는 사회적 협동조합이 있습니다. 거기에 탄소제로 저탄소 여행이라든지 탄소제로 숙박이라든지 이런 다양한 영역으로 연결될 수 있고 이미 와 있습니다. 제가 마지막으로 말씀드리고 싶은 건이 그림인데요. 파리 시장님의 15분 도시 컨셉에다가 내가 살고 있는 동네에서 30분 내에 접할 수 있는 사회적 경제가 있어서 내 삶을 지탱하는 의료 사업 그리고 재난 대비 훈련 매뉴얼 그리고 집수리 단열 개선 사업 에너지 협동조합 먹을거리 공공교통 이 모든 영역이 사람들의 삶을 기준으로 이 온실가스를 줄이면서 지역의 사회적 경제 일자리가 될수 있도록 하는 이런 그림을 그리고 저는 접근했으면 좋겠다라는 생각이 들고 정부도 사회적 경제 일자리에 대한 고민을 하고 있고 지금 그걸 하기 위해서는 정부와 국회, 기초지방정부와 의회, 중간지원조직, 시민과 마을공동체 각각의 역할이 필요한데요. 어, 정부와 국회에서 법과 제도를 잘 만드는 것도 중요하지만 동시에 
시민과 마을 공동체가 이에 관한 저는 전략을 가지고 접근하는 게 필요하다라는 말씀을 드립니다. 마지막으로 말씀드리면 은 기후위기 대응에 있어서 감축과 적응 영역으로 보게 되면 은 마을에서 진행되고 있는 동네 생활을 둘러싼 우리에게 필요한 모든 서비스와 상품이 그린 뉴딜과 연결될 수 있다. 그리고 그걸 통해서 온실가스 감축과 지역을 튼튼해야 하는 일자리로 확산하는 전략 같은 것들을 논의했으면 좋겠습니다. 네, 감사합니다. I am the moderator for this panel discussion. I'm the chief research fellow at the Korea Environment Institute. My name is Lee c h a n g h u n Uh, so we've heard from three presenters, and we have also watched a video about various uh, enterprises. And so um, I am looking at sustainability from the lens of the environment. And so we want to be able to promote a green new deal that is also inclusive, so that uh, the economy and the environment can also converge together. So I think this forum provides a very important momentum for us to be able to bring the two sectors together. So um, it's really a big honor for me to be able to moderate this uh, panel discussion today. So we have about 40 minutes for the panel discussion. And so I won't take up too much of your time. And I'm going to now give the microphone to the panel discussants. But we are also going to entertain questions and comments from the floor. And I think there might be some questions also in the chat box on Zoom or YouTube. And so first of all, I'm going to give about seven or eight minutes to the panel discussants. who'll be giving us interventions, and then we can entertain some questions to the speakers. So after the three panel discussions, then we'll have Q&A. And then uh, we can also entertain some questions from the floor or from the chat box. I think I'll be able to read those questions from the chat box on Zoom. So the MC uh, had already introduced the panel discussants, and so I won't go into that introduction once again, so we'll just uh, um, go in the order of the program. So I'd like to now invite Kim g o u n from the Seoul Institute for her intervention. Good afternoon. I'm Kim g o u n uh, from the Seoul Institute. So as I listen to the keynote speech, I was quite impressed on the fact that the social economy is pursuing new value and in all areas of our society we can uh, implement the social economy. So those ideas were very impressive. So I think that a transformation in the whole society can and the innovation can be led by the social economy organizations. So I think that will be the orientation of the social economy sector. I listened to the three uh, presentations, the following three presentations, and they were also very impressive. I'd like to ask questions. First, a question to Mr. Michael Len. You have made some pro proposals. Well, I am also focusing on the reuse Uh, policy and uh, the circular economies uh, policy. So I'm very interested in those ideas as you have presented uh, in your presentation. Uh, reuse policy have been implemented in the private sector and uh, the uh, collection and disposal uh, roles are very much uh, underlined. In Korea, in 2018, in your presentation, uh, you have uh, presented to us how much uh, reuse has been um, contributed by collection and so on. And in EU, the contribution of reuse have been quantified. I, but I don't think that there are many uh, quantification uh, data as of now. So you have managed mentioned the reuse and repair and uh, the sales of uh, repair and reuse. So I want to know how you have collected the data and how have you managed the data to so that we can uh, get the grip of uh, the. Uh, 
uh, of how a reuse and repair can contribute to the society. If you could uh, give us that methodology uh, to us, then I think we can uh, use it in our uh, resource make uh, resource uh, collection and policy making. And then uh, to Mr. Hermanson, so re new and renewable energy is very interesting for us. The eco in eco design, you have uh, underlined the role of producers. So the producers can design the eco design, and there are laws and regulations uh, that goes with it. And the resource circulation uh, sector uh, agents uh, inputs are important. But I think that those inputs have to be reflected accurately in order to empower circulation. And, the, and if, look, if we look at re, reuse, uh, we can see that there are conversations with the producers. And we want to know how the, the conversations can be made and how the inputs are reflected in the policy. So I would like to uh, know about that and listen to you on those uh, aspects. And you have mentioned the SAMSE examples to us. I think that uh, very positive results can be achieved. So that would be the good lesson for us. So I could ask you this question. So voluntarily, energy uh, self-sufficiency uh, could be made. And uh, we have to know what kind of stakeholders were there. And how can we uh, spread the lessons of SAMHSA to other areas and other local areas? Uh, there could be the advantages that we can follow, but what kind of uh, disadvantages or the uh, demerits uh, should we be aware of and not follow? Well, Korea is a very centralized society. So against this backdrop, it might be quite difficult to apply the examples of SAMHSA. So, uh, maybe we could learn um, some of the uh, maybe the disadvantages uh, that we should be aware of uh, in the Samsung example, if any. And then in social economy for Korea, you have made some proposals to us. So I think that's very thankful. But then we have to think about the real world um, of social economy. Social economy uh, pursues value and it provides vitality in the private sector. So it has very good advantages. But then in the public sector, the public sector uh, commissions, decommissions to the uh, the private sector and contracts are made to outsource. But then the contract period would be only to two to three years. So it's a very short term. And every time when it is implemented, uh, we cannot see uh, lots of high quality uh, projects implemented because of the short term um, limits. So for the social economy to contribute to uh, the society, uh, what kind of institutional measures should be improved? This is a question to Ms. Yu Jin. Um, so how can we respond to this in a healthy way? So if you have any ideas on this, please give us the idea. Thank you very much. Well, you have uh, given a very good explanation, so I wouldn't summarize again. But then for the uh, foreign participants, I think I should uh, give you a summary to Mr. Len. What is the methodology to measure social value? And then, related to eco design, well, how do you communicate with the producer? So, so those were the questions to Mr. Len, and then to Mr. Hermanson. Uh, Korea has a very centralized energy system. In order to um, uh, apply the Samse uh, model, what kind of things should be should we be aware of, and uh, uh, what kind of cautions should we take? And then. And then um, we would like to ask Mr. Kim min -sok. Uh Mr. Kim min -sok is from the Sustainability Lab. He's a director there.
Good afternoon. I'm from the Sustainability Lab. I'm Min Seok Kim or Kim Min Seok in Korean. So uh, thank you very much for your presentations. I really enjoyed the three presenters. And so it's uh, really inspiring uh, for me to be able to deal with this kind of climate change and environment at the Social Economy International Forum. So before we were talking about inequality and job security and labor and things like that, but today we've been talking about circular economy, we've been talking about climate change and climate crisis, and what kind of role the social economy can play in all of this. So it's really um, uh, inspiring for me to spe see this kind of phenomena. So, of course, the social economy has been playing a very important role, but now that kind of role or the creation of the social value has become a lot more diverse. And so I think it's now time for us to be able to uh, share that with a broader society. So um, I have a few comments and I also have a few questions. So we've been talking about environment and also sustainability, and one thought came into my mind. Dr. Lee had came up with an example. So... Uh, so there are some examples of how to overcome or adjust to the climate crisis. I'm actually building a house myself in the rural areas. So I'm not an architect. And so when I was talking with my family members, I asked them, what kind of house do you want? We, you know, we're going to live there for the rest of our lives. Uh, but, you know, the environment is very important. And so my wife said that, okay, let's uh, set up some solar panels. PV, uh, PV panels, and so it's a more energy cons um, conservative uh, house. So I talked with the architect, and we've been having a discussion for the last four months. We've been designing for the last four months, because I'm not an expert in architecture. And so I want to be able to uh, build a house that's environmentally friendly. We don't want too much air conditioning in the summer, and we don't want too much heating in the winter. It's really, really difficult. And also, when you're talking with the designers and the architects, you know, they talk about the cost all the time. It's too expensive to do that kind of building. So from the consumer's perspective, you come in with a more kind of a rational conclusion. But that rational conclusion... Is it really rational when it also comes to the ecology or the ecosystem? I also majored in environmental studies, and so I do have a lot of interest in environment. And so, um, you know, I want to build a house that's eco-friendly, but realistically, it's really, really difficult to do that. And so I was in a dilemma, and so that's why I was able to listen to the three presentations with a great interest. In Samso, you have the um, energy self-sufficient village, and uh, we also heard from the case of reuse, and also Dr. Lee Eugene talked about the Korean New Deal, how um, how it can be implemented. So, in regarding to the reuse. I will have a question for Mr. Michael Len. So you talked about how, well, according to the presentation, it's th page 30 in the conference proceedings, but it says that pre-use, we, we need in pre-use, there is a policy that we need, about three, and I think um, Ko and Kim also talked about the echo design. So I also want to take on the third point, so fiscal measures oriented towards the reuse and repair, including EPR and VAT. So, um, and you also talked about the stronger laws supporting reuse and repair. So, and then as an as a, a one uh, subtopic, you talked about the fiscal measures like EPR and VAT. EPR is extended producer responsibility, right? So we need more responsibility. In the case of Korea, when we are trying to recycle or reuse something, laws and regulations always come in to uh, come up as an obstacle because we want to collect something and we want to be able to reuse the resources, but the le laws are very stringent, and so not anyone can collect uh, the uh, waste and not anyone can recycle. And so, and so it's a very strict uh, laws as to who can collect the waste and recycle the waste. 
And if there is a problem in that process, there is a clause regarding liability, which is also very strictly regulated by law. And so we have not been able to realize all of that in Korea. So you also talked about stronger laws. In the case of pre-use, have you been able to come up or did you do you face any kind of legal challenges or legal restrictions that you find um, too restrictive? And also, when you talk about laws, you know, you have to have people who are in power. They want the law on their side. And so when we talk about circulating resources and when we talk about social economy and we want it to play a more important role in society, we also need laws and regulations that are more favorable for the social economy. So I think we need more ideas for that kind of pro-social economy kind of laws and regulations. And and so you also talked about stakeholders, uh, Mr. S um, Hermanson. You talked about uh, stakeholders, and I completely agree to what you said. Uh, but yes, we know that in theory, but when we talk about practicing bringing many stakeholders together, you know, they have different cultures, they use different language, and they have different behavioral patterns. So um, it's not always that easy. And the public sector and the private sectors are also different as well. And so when you want multi-stakeholder kind of collaboration, it's really important to see what kind of driver is. So let's protect the environment. Let's save the earth. That's a too broader message. So I'm not sure. Perhaps this is my bias, but those kind of message is just too broad. The reason why I think Somse was able to succeed in bringing all the stakeholders together probably was somewhere else. So it's not just about the saving the environment. There must have been some other kind of driver or the momentum that brought the stakeholders together. So what was that uh, driver in Samso? And did you face any challenges or difficulties whilst you were bringing the different stakeholders together? Now my question for Dr. Yujin Lee. So yes, we are talking a lot about the Green New Deal in Korea. And so I was also very much interested on in what you had to say. So I think, um, you, yes, you said um, it's really about now um, implementing what we have said. And we also have to be able to measure the results and we have to make improvements. And then we have to complement any kind of um, insufficiencies that we have made and then uh, go back. But then when you talked about the players, you have the very small village enterprises, then you have the private sector, you have the public sector, you have a variety of stakeholders coming together and it's all a beautiful picture. But how can you measure the results? Remember I said that I want to, I'm building a house right now and I want to be um, eco-friendly. So say I make a very uh, energy efficient house. So then I want to think and measure how much my house, my environmentally friendly house, had contributed to the environment. How would I do that? So of course you have many stakeholders and they exert a lot of different efforts from various fields. They're all separate, you know, but how are we going to measure the performance of the results? the methodology. So I was curious to know what you thought. And also, we may um, have some kind of a metric to measure the results, and then we want to be able to use it as data later on. And somebody has to be able to collect all the data that is being generated from various parts of society. And so who would that be? Who would be the main player or agent in collecting that data? So these were some of the comments and questions for the three presenters. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. So just like the previous case, previous, uh, case I would like to summarize the questions. 
first reuse and repair the laws and regulations are needed and uh, the very strong one and you have mentioned EPR but I would like to know uh, in what context you have mentioned EPR and what does it mean and second in EU or in the EU member countries uh, there are a lot of social stakeholders and uh, they participate in and engage in the uh, the creation of laws and regulations so in the process of making the process the uh, social economy is engaging very strongly so what kind of things should be uh, incorporated in that process and then so there are a lot of different stakeholders participating in uh, the social economy, but we have to create a cooperative relationship. But there may be some problems in between. So I'd like to know how you resolve these problems. And then um, uh, for Ms. Eugen, I think you would be uh, well resolving uh, the questions because you have listened in Korean. And third, I'd like to uh, invite Mr. Yoo Young-woo from Korea Social Economy Network. Well, now we are uh, wearing masks and it's it's very hot and warm, so uh, I would like to ask for your understanding and uh, take off my mask. By 2050, the net carbon, net zero, is announced by uh, countries across the world. Well, if I consider my age, I don't think that I can uh, see uh, how it ends. Uh, yeah, because it's by 2050, so it's very unfortunate for me. I think the net zero society should come earlier, for example, by 2040. So that's uh, some thought that I had. But I would like to be hopeful. We need to do it by 2050 and through social economy. So these are the thoughts that I that that have been running in my mind simultaneously. So we have listened to the three cases in uh, different uh, areas of the world, and uh, Ms. Yu Jin's uh, presentation was very interesting for me because these are some. Uh, some of the things that are directly related to uh, the local area. So we have to think about the tasks and challenges of the social economy that we have to consider. And there are common denominators across the presentations. These are local, also local community and the citizens as a main agent and uh, need uh, need based uh, projects and circular economy and cooperation and solidarity these are the keywords that have been mentioned throughout the three presentations and we have listened to many cases so related to COVID-19 and climate crisis, I think that social economy uh, would be a good factor to respond to these uh, crises. There are many advantages. Um, there are maybe two. First, the economy will be based on local uh, community and cooperation and solidarity will uh, promote um, the people-to-people uh, -people exchanges. So it will be based on peoples and that will ensure sustainability. So these are the things that are argued and uh, promoted by the social economy sector. So now the global uh, societies and the uh, countries are investing a lot of uh, the budget to tackle COVID-19 and climate crisis. Well, I think uh, there's the key concept. I think the general citizens do acknowledge that uh, these are very serious issues, but I don't think they are actually implementing this in their real life. I don't really think that they are doing it. The residents and the local community members uh, should have something or a system to make it happen in the real world. So I think it there needs to be a system. If we need to overcome the crisis, then uh, every agent of our local community, the citizens, should uh, practice uh, these kind of concepts in their everyday life. So, which means that we need to have a local community strategy established.
Of course, the central government and the local government should uh, engage in large-scale projects and uh, build infrastructure. But to make it sustainable, we should make it in view into the everyday lives of the average citizens. And uh, there should be 11 sectors mentioned by uh, Ms. Iuj, Dr. Eugene, but then there may be other things that can be applied in our everyday lives. I think we should develop those. So we need to have a pattern in our everyday life, and that would be the key for the local community strategy. And in the local community uh, strategy and process, we need to consider the citizens or the local community members or the social economy uh, agents. They need to have uh, the agent the, to, to uh, lead these efforts and should have the agency. If there are too much intervention from the central and local governments, then I don't think that uh, the, uh, uh, the average citizens will, will take the lead. So I think the voluntary efforts should be more vitalized and promoted. And that should be supported by the policies and the budgets of the government. So in that process, I think the role of the local government is very important. The urban area and the rural area have different uh, situations, so uh, the localization strategy should focus on what uh, is happening in their local area. And uh, from the outset of uh, establishing plans, uh, the uh, local community citizens and the local uh, local social economy sector uh, agents should be participating, and the relations between the government and uh, the local citizens should be horizontal in the governance. So there should be a system that could support this and also openness and transparency are very necessary. In social economy, we need to focus on local strategies, localization strategies, laws and regulations, policy, budgets and infrastructure. There may be many things that we have to do but we have to do it in a very efficient manner and also we have to customize and focus on uh, the local community. I think we have to research on how we can do it and come up with a good plan. Uh, we have to come together and think about how to make this happen. And next is uh, a question to Mr. Hermanson. In the, in the project, about 400 million Denmark krone uh, was, uh, pl was planned to be invested. So I want to know how much portion of the investment will come from local government and the central government and how much local residents have decided to invest. And uh, since local residents have decided to participate, I think that this project has been successful. In the process of engaging local residents, what were the difficult points? What were the challenges? I would like to uh, listen to that as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Yes. There are some facts that we must remember. Uh, Green New Deal and local economy are localization projects, so to speak. And so there was a question for Mr. Hermanson. So it was about the investment. And how did you get the local residents to also agree and participate in the investments? That was a question for Mr. Hermanson. So um, it's uh, we have 3.30 right now in Korea. The moderator's role is to keep time. And so from 4 o'clock, uh, we also have session number two taking place. And so we also need to take a break before we go on to session number two. So I'm going to decrease uh, the break to 15 minutes and we're going to use up five more minutes. So we have 15 minutes left. So now I'm going to um, ask the 
Oh yeah, we've got the um, questions from the internet. So if if there is anybody on the floor who would like a question, then we could listen to that and we can get the speakers to answer all the questions at the same time. Anybody who has a question from the floor? So yes, of course you can also raise questions through the YouTube. So I have a couple of questions from YouTube. So let me read them out for you. So there are actually many, many questions that were raised, but due to time constraints, uh, we just chose two questions. One is one big issue in Korea is the uh, delivery. Because of the COVID-19, there's a lot of deliveries that are being made uh, of um, one-time use plastics and styrofoam, etc. In Europe, what are you do doing about this? Because uh, do you have any plans to recycle these resources? So this is a question for Mr. Michael Lan. What are you doing about all the plastic waste? And there's another question. Okay, so um, environmental activists should not be the only participant to save the economy, uh, excuse me, the environment. So how can we raise the awareness of citizens in general? So this is a question for Dr. Lee. How are we going to raise awareness of not just uh, the environmental activists, but also the general public? So these are the two questions. So I'm going to give five minutes to each speaker. So please keep to your time limit. So I'm going to give you five minutes and please answer the questions that have been raised to you. So first of all, uh, Mr. Michael Lan, would you like to go first? Thank you. Thank you so much also for the opportunity to, to be here and for all the all the questions. It's really, really a privilege. Um, just in general, because all those questions are, I would say, they're very uh, varied, maybe moving towards the environmental side of the discussions um, of uh, how to support social enterprises in the circular economy. Um, but just to say that in general, our overall approach in terms of being able to support um, social enterprises active in the circular economy is really to uh, make sure that it's important to analyze their business models, to see how they're operating, and to see how legislation can be used as a means of gaining new partnerships, in particular, we would say, and develop their activities, so partnerships with municipalities and partnerships with the private sector. So all the issues that you have raised concerning data collection, eco-design, extended producer responsibility, always in the back of our minds is about how can all these laws be used as a means to be able to develop the activities of social enterprises active in reuse and repair. So going specifically to the questions which, which were asked, um, I'll go uh, in a, I would say, from, from start to finish. Concerning data on reuse, um, you are very right that there is very little data on reuse and repair out there at the moment. I think this is one of the reasons because um, the focus on reuse and repair has been very low. Traditionally, we've been focused on recycling, so material recycling, and all the data, all the sorry, money and investment and data collection has been very much focused on recycling. Um, but now, with the discussions about the move to a circular economy and the idea that reuse has many benefits for the environment, for the climate, for job creation there is an increased impetus about measuring reuse. And in fact, now, um, under new EU waste law, it's um, going to be made mandatory to measure reuse indicators. We are currently developing indicators for reuse um, at EU level, and these are going to be used maybe as the basis for targets for reuse in the future. So this is very important to know. And in terms of the methodology, the ones we are using are weight-based methodologies. So we are measuring um, the weight of the, uh, the products and so forth. And I think what's really important to know is that job creation indicators, so to integrate when making impact assessments for policies, that job creation has to be a very important factor in, uh, in analyzing before making, making policies. So I think this is uh, important. And it's not always done, especially in the, in the environmental domain. Um, we can also talk about social impact uh, assessments as well, but this is um, something that is currently being developed, but a very important thing. I would like to say the point on targets and measuring reuse and targets, there are a number of examples in Europe of setting targets for reuse, and the majority of them are there to support actually social enterprises developing their activities. In Flanders, for example, 
in, that's a region of Belgium. Uh, they set in the past a quantitative target of five kilograms of reused material per capita in order to support the creation of 3,000 full-time equivalent jobs. So the, the link between reuse and jobs was really, really well made there. And now the target has been increased to seven kilos, but it's just uh, as a little example. On eco-design, um, in terms of how do, what are we doing on eco-design, what's important is that our role um, as reuse, uh, together with other organizations, is to really support the role of independent repairers, who often find it very difficult to access repair and service manuals of manufacturers, the appropriate tools, and just general information about how to open up a product. It's becoming very difficult to repair the products of today and becoming very expensive also as a result. And so this discussion between manufacturers and independent repairers is something that is being coordinated at EU level um, through a number of different forums organized by the European Commission of which we are part of. So we're part of those discussion forums in terms of, and that's how we engage directly with the, with the manufacturers there. Um, it's not easy, but it's moving in the right direction. Um, on extended producer responsibility, this is a particular um, economic tool used in the field of waste management, uh, typically used to finance the waste treatment of products, but there are debates now about how this tool can be used also to influence eco-design. Um, to cut a long story short, um, if you are a social enterprise working in waste management, it's extremely important to have partnerships with EPR schemes, but it's incre incredibly difficult to have partnerships with uh, EPR schemes because maybe they are not 100% focused on reuse, they control the waste stream. And as uh, the speaker quite rightly said, it's um, once an EPR scheme is in place, it's very difficult to be able to, I would say, just enter and handle waste. It's very strictly controlled as well in Europe. So we are really trying to uh, set rules. There are a number of countries who have set rules, uh, legislation to ensure that social enterprises have partnerships with EPR schemes. In France, a recent development has been that 5% of the money which is raised through extended producer responsibility is put into a fund to support social enterprises working in reuse. I think this is very, very interesting also for Europe because it's only one country which has done that. Um, on social economy and how to integrate um, social enterprise in general, we're doing this in different ways. As I mentioned, there are um, uh, there is a new social economy action plan which is being created by the European Commission. I think this is the first time at European level that we will have, I would say, a horizontal and strategic view of how to support social enterprises, both from um, the, the, the business model perspective, um, from the financing perspective, and it's, it's really, I find, um, a very important moment to be able to use such an action plan that can, I would say, be able to use, be used horizontally in different forms of, of policy making, whether it be environment, whether it be health, so on and so forth, because the knowledge about social enterprise and social economy is still relatively low, especially when you look in different government departments. So I think these kinds of horizontal laws which would force policymakers from different government departments um, to consider social enterprises when creating new policies, uh, I think is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, and I think just one little uh, added extra there, the importance of social enterprises in the field of skills and upskilling is um, something which is being very uh, closely looked at by the European Commission, especially in a COVID recovery. I think in the circular economy, and I can imagine um, Soren will mention as well, in, uh, in energy and a future green uh, recovery, we need to have, um, I would say, specialists and people of all skill levels working in these fields and social enterprises, especially work integration social enterprises who are providing skills to people who maybe um, were distanced from the labor market and finding it difficult to find a job are training people for the jobs of tomorrow. And so creating new programs and support structures for social enterprises in this field of skills, I think is very important. And very lastly, on single use plastics from the colleague, 
um, who asked the question on YouTube. It's a very big issue also in Europe, uh, single-use plastics. There is a new directive which has come in place uh, called the Single-Use Plastics Directive here in um, Europe. But in terms of, uh, so this will ban uh, the sales of um, certain single-use plastic products um, on the European market, including like plastic straws and cotton earbuds and things like that. Um, but what's important is that now we hope that these kinds of regulations will encourage new forms of business models focused on the reuse of cutlery, of plates, of any forms of, um, I would say, uh, packaging that normally we would consider single use is now a real opportunity to create multi-use um, packaging. I think that's everything because I don't want to take up the time from other colleagues, but um, I hope that answers most of the questions. Thank you. I do. Thank you very much for giving your answers. Yes, and so now I'm going to give the mic to Mr. Soren Honansen. Could you answer the questions that were raised towards you? And uh, you remember, you have five minutes. Thank you. Um, very interesting uh, questions, uh, but but I, I'll, I think I'll I'll try to make an order of the of the answers. Denmark is part of the UN uh, declaration and the Paris uh, Agreement. So so uh, in that in that order, we have we have promised uh, to to follow the the, the contracts uh, given to us by by the agreement. Uh, we also a member of the European Union, and and therefore we are we are uh, respecting or we are following the EU directives that is telling us uh, what what targets we are working towards. So this leads me to the to 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 try to answer the questions because this is then kind of making the Danish directives for the local actions. And I think this is the order you have to understand that we are not we are not inventing the world ourselves. We are doing this in a very uh, what do you call it multinational. Uh, cooperation with many other states and many other systems because we are part of these bigger systems so you can say the resource circulation is not just a danish circulation but it's a european and a global circulation of resources so therefore it's really important to understand the the connection to the global uh, agreement uh, with the local action and, and and with this set how do we do this well we we try to fo to have like a top down bottom up approach to the to the actions the top down is to give us a framework we are defining what ambition denmark have uh, and we have just set the new goal that we want to cut down 70% of the 1990 uh, 1990 uh, carbon emission or, or climate gas emission and 70% reduction is very, very ambitious and 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 it has to happen before 2030 it's it's a stronger ambition than the European Union, but 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 it's following kind of the the concept of of the cut, uh, of the what you call it climate action ambitions. We do this in Denmark by having a very strict building code. So when when the question was, I'm building a house, how do I do this? I think we are building houses according to the building code, which is very strict towards climate action and and energy re uh, use energy savings and system administration and the use of materials, insulation and all kinds of things, window framing, uh, double glazing, uh, energy saving measures, and, and also support systems like uh, heat pumps and other things where we buy uh, stuff from Korea, <laughs> uh, very efficient, good heat pumps uh, to, to, to serve the purpose. We have a tax system where we kind of taxate the polluter and we, we, we award the, the, the saver uh, of, of energy here. So we have a quite uh, significant carbon tax in Denmark where we actually focus uh, on the polluter or in on the what you call it not rational co um, consumption by taxating this in, 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 in such a high level that people are driven to change the system here, which leads again to technology choice. Uh, it is up to the consumer to choose the technology, but if, if the top down administration then direct this by giving subsidies to the best technology available for the purpose so we can save energy, then the choice is easy for people that you will choose the technology that is on the market that can solve, solve the problem uh, in, and not just buy a bigger car or a heavier engine and stuff like that. You will be punished uh, by, by heavy tax uh, if you do that, but you will be awarded if you choose um, an, 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 an environmental friendly technology. So central governance, but local action is actually the key to, to, to the transformation in Denmark. When you then go to the, to the, to the question about how, do, how did we do it locally on, um, on Samsung, I think what we have done here, the 400 million Danish kroner has to be seen in a bigger perspective. 
I think that 20, 30 percent is uh, the public money. <coughs> sorry, and the and the rest is pi private money. So we have included farmers who are building wind turbines on their fields. We have inv inv uh, invited citizens to organize themselves in cooperative owned uh, district heating systems. So a town of 400 people or 500 people will build, instead of having individual heating system in, in every house, we have an underground piping system where we actually centralized uh, the, the heating uh, sub, uh, production. And we use local resources. It can be store, it can be waste, it can be many different things we use but, but we, we find the best local resource to heat the houses uh, in the system. And because we have this corporate system, we share the cost, which is making the heat cost for every house cheaper than if you had an individual system. So there's a carrot and a whip system in this also that you, if you make the choice, it'll be cheaper for you. And, and if you kind of do the effort in, in coordinating this in a, in a, in a what you call a local uh, cooperative way, then it's better for everybody. But this is a very social, uh, what do you call it, economy we're talking about here. And as Michael was mentioning, uh, kind of the bottom line is that it creates a better local economy, but it's also creating a lot of local jobs because this, this, this will lead us to kind of a system where we will benefit from this. So the driver is not to save the climate and the polar bears in the Arctic. It is actually to save, save ourselves and the local community so we can have a better life with a better economy and at the same time act uh, responsible to climate uh, changes and, and all the, the problems we see ahead of us. So this was my five minutes. I had my alarm clock uh, ringing, so I think I'll stop here to leave you so you can uh, have a break also. So thank you very much for my... Thank you very much. So yes, um, five minutes is also up, so I'm going to give the mic to Dr. Lee. So I will have to give you just 30 minutes. So if you have any answers for the discussions then you can uh, you can skip that and just give the answers on the questions posted on YouTube well well I do have things that I like to talk to Mr. Hermanson but I'll have to pass uh, well as Mr. Kingo has mentioned the uh, public sector does not trust the private sector so that's a limitations for uh, the social economy to move further uh, or expand. In Anzan, uh, there was uh, 7 billion uh, assets, but then the citizens could uh, collect 4.5 billion. That was because the Anzan city has trusted the Anzan citizens and have helped them uh, with a lot of infrastructure. But So our social economy should not just voluntarily grow. The public sector should uh, engage the social economy as a partner in order for uh, the social economy to expand. Well, the 30 seconds uh, limit has passed. I'm very sorry. Well, just one last word. So in order to expand the social economy, I think that the public, uh, the servants should also acknowledge and be aware of the climate crisis and they have to change uh, the the bottom up and the top down should be harmonized together. So that's one thing that I'd like to add. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. So as the moderator, I haven't done my uh, job uh, perfectly, but then I'd like to thank the uh, speakers and the panelists for your good ideas and discussions. And also I'd like to thank the uh, speakers from uh, Europe who have participated um, ours conference from very early hour in your country. Now, after the COVID is finished, I hope that we could meet face to face and have more exciting panel discussion next time. So with this, I would like to conclude the panel discussion for this session.